Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John chapter 2, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. And this is what it says. And on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to, up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine, they did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then that which is poor. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of this, his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Pray with me. Lord, we want to believe we want to lean on. We want to rely on. We want to, we want to have faith and trust in you. Breathe that grace on us right now, this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The year was 1306. The king of Scotland was Robert the Bruce. He was king of Scotland, but the, the English had defeated him several times. So he's, he was confined to the island of Rathlane, or Rathlin, in, off the coast of Ireland. He was sitting there one day watching a spider try and connect his, his web to, the, to a beam. Well, six times the spider failed to attach the, its web to the beam. And that's when Robert the Bruce said, Now shall this spider teach me what I am to do. For I also have failed six times. Well, you can imagine how the story goes. That it was on the seventh time. The very next time, the spider tried to attach its web to the beam, and it succeeded. Robert the Bruce saw that as a sign. He left the island of Rathlin, and he went back to Scotland. He gathered together some troops, and there he mounted a successful campaign against the English and it was at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314 that Robert the Bruce won the independence, the Scottish independence, from the English. And he points to a spider, a spider that gave him a sign. Well, wouldn't we all love a sign like that? I'm not saying spiders, but a sign. Something that points the way. Something that gives us the direction. Something that, that, that lets us know which way to go and where to go. 
Well, that's exactly what the writer of the Gospel of John does for you and for me. Here in Scripture, that he gives us a sign, and that's what I read in verse 11. The beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. That Jesus was giving signs to point the direction of a new creation. We know this not because this is the only place. It says in chapter 4, verse 54, it says, this being the second of his signs that Jesus gave. That we're supposed to be counting the signs. Well, what's this about? The Gospel of John starts off letting the reader know that this is a creation story. The Gospel of John starts off in the beginning. Well, that's the same way that Genesis starts off. The old creation story starts off in the beginning, and now the new creation ushered in through Jesus Christ, it begins in the beginning. And rather than the six days of the, the, the first creation, the, this new creation, that it begins in, in six, seven signs or seven miracles. The eighth being on the first day of the week, the resurrection in the garden where Jesus breathes into his disciples the breath of his Holy Spirit, the same way that God breathed into Adam the breath of life. That John is leading you and me. He's leading us along the way with the signs of Jesus. So don't miss it. Don't miss the signs. Don't miss the signs. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Don't miss the signs that, that Jesus gives us. And the first sign that I want to talk about is don't miss the, the sign of his presence. Verse 11 says, The beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Manifested his glory. Now I'm trying to think of when was the last time I used those three words in a sentence, manifested his glory. Some of times, I've never used that. It, that's not language that I use. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody use that kind of language before. And some of your Bibles read, revealed his glory. Well, still, it's, a, it's better, but it's, it's not language that I use. But to the first century reader, these words would have screamed off the page. They might not have been able to hear anything else because they knew that the glory of God that it resided only two places in the universe. One, the glory of God resided in the heavens. And the only place the glory of God resided on this earth was in the temple. More specifically, in the Holy of Holies. And it wasn't the kind of thing that you could say, well, hey kids, jump in the car, we're going to go see the Holy of Holies, and I'll just pull back the curtain, and there it is. There's the Holy of Holies right there. Nope. That's not the way that folks approached the Holy of Holies. As a matter of fact, there was only one person on earth that could approach the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest. And it was so thrilling. It was so dangerous. There was so much power in the presence of God that when the high priest entered the Holy of Holies only one time a year, they tied a rope to him in case he died there in the, the, in the, in the glory in the presence of God. Nobody was going in to get him, so they pull him out by the ankle with, with the rope that they had attached to him. And now, Jesus gives you and me a sign. A sign that his presence in this new creation is no longer in the Holy of Holies. That it's in a wedding in Cana of Galilee. That it's in a marriage. It's in the home. It's in the common. It's in the ordinary. That this new creation isn't like the old creation. That the presence of God, that it, the, the, the thrilling presence of God, that it's all around for those who have eyes to see. That it's in the, it's in the home. It's in the marriage. It's in the everyday. William Barclay says, the home is a paradox, you know, where opposite things are true. On the one hand, 
it's the happiest, most precious place on earth. But on the other hand, we claim the right to be far more discourteous, more boorish, more selfish, and impolite than we would be to any society of stranger. We treat the ones we love most in a way we would never dare to treat an acquaintance. The presence, the spirit of the risen Christ is it, as shocking as it sounds, is in, in your home and mine, in your marriage and mine, in your everyday and ordinary and mine. Let it not be something that scares us away, but let it be something that thrills, that thrills our heart, that we have hope in, that we're not alone. We're not alone. We're not isolated from one another. Let it be a source of encouragement, a source of power, a source of strength. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. He's freely given to you and me His presence. He's freely given to you and me His Spirit. And if we have eyes to see, certainly it'll change our language. Certainly it'll change the way we hear. Certainly it'll change the way we approach the everyday and the ordinary. Second Peter 1.7 says, God has not given us a, a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and discipline. That His presence, His presence has given you and me a spirit of power, not of timidity, of love, not of timidity, of discipline, a strength that we don't have, not just to, to hope one day to do what God wants, but the power to do it now, today. His presence, His presence. May it give you hope. May it give you encouragement in the everyday, in the ordinary, in the marriage, and in the home. Don't miss the sign, the sign of His presence. Second thing I want to talk about this morning is don't miss the sign of His abundance. Mary went to Jesus and said, they have no more wine. Well, we hear that, and today we go, hmm, that's too bad. Or if we know a little bit more about it, we might say, ooh, well, oops, that's a social faux pas. But it's a whole lot more than a too bad or an oops or a social faux pas. We have records of occasions where people were, were sued. Families were sued for running out of wine at a wedding. Where fines were levied against people for running out of wine at a wedding. It's a whole lot more than a too bad, an oops, or a faux pas. So Jesus didn't just blow it off. That what these folks were going through, he wanted to address. And in addressing what they were going through, he didn't answer Mary with, well, how much wine do they need? No, what he did is he called the servants and he said, fill these, in verse 6, he said, now there's six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each and he said fill the water pots with water quick math says six water pots 20 or 30 gallons each that's 120 to 180 gallons of wine will you think that'll be enough I, th <laughs> I think it gives to you and me the character of a, a generous abundant God who gives us more than enough more than, than a little to get by. That we worship a gracious and abundant God whose character in the first creation, when it says, and God created, that word in Hebrew in the first creation was bara. And bara doesn't mean just created. He got together some things and he made something. No, it means to be made full, to be made fat, to be made abundant, to be made overflowing, to be made flourishing. That our God isn't a stingy God. Our God gives 
with an abundance. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And what are the riches of God? I don't know, but it's more than enough. The psalmist says he, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't know how much that is, but it's more than enough. And that's what God has provided for you and for me. And it's also what God desires of you and me. God can use this church to change the world. And I don't mean just the, the change in the world somewhere or the church out there. This church, I've seen it because I've, I've, I've gotten glimpses of it. Because you've been generous, when this pandemic began in March, quickly, you and I were able to put our little with God's much and, and, a, and an abundance was provided for families in need. Because the, the, the children and families were sequestered at home and not able to go to school for the school lunch program, that you and I, you and I met that need. And we fed a thousand people a week. We're still doing it now. Because you've given and given freely. You've given graciously. You've taken part in what God's doing. But it's not only in the feeding of a, a thousand people every week right here in Roswell that when the pandemic started, because you'd been generous, we were able to hire Hilma Kantu to help us reach out to those students that while they were home, that we could, members of this church, virtually online, could help tutor them to let them know that they matter to God, they matter to us. And members of this church began to, to reach out, to tutor kids who speak English as a second language and helping them with their, their reading, with their school. That our generous God has used you and me through generous gifts to reach out, to single women and their families, to provide housing. That it was a commitment we made at the beginning of the year. And we chose to, for them to know the generosity of God, and we gave it right when the, the emergency hit. And God continued to be generous, and He used you and me to do that again and again. God uses us, but so often we think, that this new creation, that life, that life that it's kept inside our wallets or inside our purses, and then it's a, a life that we've got to hold on to or hoard. It's a life that too often we try and live by, by, by gathering it close as if there's never going to be enough. And the grace of God the grace of God, we have a tendency to, to try and choke it out. He's ushered in a new creation, and you and I get to, to be a part of it. You and I get to give generously. You and I get to take part in what God's doing in the world. And He's supplied all our needs according to His riches. And this morning, I want to invite you to give and to give generously in what God's doing in the world. It's gracious plenty. And don't miss the signs. Don't miss the signs. Don't miss the sign of His abundance. Don't miss the sign of His presence. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is don't miss the sign of His victory. When I was a kid, I used to enjoy watching sports on TV. And by far the best, this was before there was ESPN. And by far the best sports programming was ABC Sports. And Jim McKay would, had the bumper video that would start off all of the ABC sports, and it would talk about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. 
I don't know if you remember that, the, the little bumper, the, the video that they did every time the program started with the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. But just in case you don't remember it, I have it for you on video. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sports, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. The thrill of victory, absolutely the best. And the agony of defeat. For 20 years that video showed. And the, the thrill of victory changed over those 20 years. Sometimes it would be auto racing. Sometimes it would be the track and field. Sometimes it would be hockey. Sometimes it would be baseball. Sometimes it changed. But the agony of defeat, it, it was the same. The same for 20 years. It was ski jumper Vinko Bogataj from Slovenia. He was the agony of de- he was the symbol for the agony of defeat. I-, I can't imagine what that'd be like, being the symbol for the agony of defeat everywhere you went. They didn't even need to call him by name. He goes to a party, they said, This is the agony of defeat. And everybody, oh yes, I've seen you. I know who you are. I've seen it again and again and again. Well, you know, I think often it is that Christians identify with the agony of defeat. That for some reason, Christians think that there's something religious about rehearsing again and again and again the agony of defeat. Or maybe rehearsing again and again the worst defeat that they've had. That for some reason, they consider it religious to, to practice the agony of defeat. But Jesus ushered in a new creation that through the cross, the agony of defeat was wiped away for you and me once and for all. All those things that would destroy us, the worst that we've done, the worst that we can do or will do, has been pardoned, forgiven. And the thrill of victory, well, it's It's experienced through the resurrected Christ. And the thrill is so great that 19 chapters before it happens, John has to tell you and me, he has to to telegraph it, to to project it, to make sure that, that you and I know what's coming up. That the thrill in our hearts of the resurrected Christ will be seen in this very first sign. So in verse 1, this is what the Bible says. And on the third day... There was a wedding in Cana of Galilee on the third day. You and I know what happened on the third day. John knows what happened on the third day. Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And there, there, when he rose from the grave, he breathed out his Holy Spirit to his disciples then and his disciples now. And in that spirit, he offered a new creation, power, power that we don't have in the here and now, that we might know his victory, that we won't live in the agony of defeat, that we'll know his strength in our lives, in the here and now. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, that the old things have passed away, that new things have come. This morning, it may be that your defeat, the worst that you've ever done, is something you've been practicing for a long time. And you've not experienced the thrill, the thrill of the risen Christ, His Holy Spirit living His life in you. That you didn't know there was a new creation that Jesus came to usher in. And you've not looked for the sign of that new creation in your life. I want to pray with you, and I want to pray with you now. Join with me in prayer. 
Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you have life. Not existence, but life. A life that's full. A life that's abundant. A life, a life that has not the spirit of timidity, but the spirit of your power. The spirit of your love. That has the power of your discipline living in us now, this day. Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, give us strength. Power. Power that, that we know that, that that defeat, it's been wiped away once and for all. It's been forgiven because of what you did on the cross for us. And we might know the assurance of your Holy Spirit living inside of us, and we might become a new creation. Each decision that we make under your power, that we might know that we're not alone, and, and we, by each decision, we begin being made new, brand new, this day, now. Jesus, it may be that we haven't kept our eyes on the sign of your victory in our lives. Give us that power. Or it may be that this day that we've not known the sign of your presence in the everyday in the ordinary we've sensed we were alone because our eyes weren't weren't looking for you Jesus breathe the power of your holy spirit on us this day that we might know that we're not alone and give us eyes to see your presence. And that you begin to change, to change our language. The way we speak at home. The way we speak in a marriage to our children. To, in the everyday, in the ordinary. Jesus, it also may be that, that we've just been captured by a stingy heart. I know you have power enough, power enough to break the hard and the stingy heart. That we can take part in your grace, your abundance. And we can reach out and, and live according to your riches. And not just what we think we have in our wallets. Grant us strength enough, grace enough that this day might be different because we see your signs. We see your spirit, your presence, your abundance, and your victory starting now this day. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.